Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Moore, Project Manager for the Association of Community Cancer Centers. I'm eager to introduce Dr. Sanjeev Agawala as our expert presenter for the 15th webinar of the series hosted by the Institute for Clinical Immunology, ICLEO. As you may know, ICLEO is an institute of ACCC and it's the only initiative to prepare multidisciplinary cancer care providers for their complex implementation of immunology in a community setting. The ICLEO program provides a host of educational resources and tools such as webinars, newsletters, e-learning module courses, tumor subcommittee updates, an immersive I.O. visiting expert program, and live meetings. Now for today's webinar, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Agawala, Chief of Medical Oncology and Hematology at St. Luke's Cancer Center and Professional of Medicine at Temple University School of Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Agawala is also an esteemed member of the ICLEA Advisory Committee. Dr. Agawala is nationally and internationally recognized as the expert in research and treatment of melanoma and immunotherapy of cancer and has presented and led numerous conferences and meetings across the globe. Dr. Agawala has written and contributed to over 150 publications and book chapters on melanoma and other research areas. He is a broad certified in oncology, hematology, and internal medicine, as well as an active member of several professional and scientific societies, such as American Association for Cancer Research, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and the, Euro the European Society of Medical Oncology, and the Society for Melanoma Research. Dr. Agawala has been the principal investigator for multiple, multiple clinical trials involving immunotherapy and targeted therapy for melanoma. As a result of his dedication to melanoma and immunotherapy research, Dr. Arguella has received several honors, including listings as one of America's top doctors for cancer and best doctors in the United States. Now for some housekeeping notes. Please feel free to submit questions to our presenter by texting your questions in the box on your dashboard. I will pose these questions to Dr. Arguella at the conclusion of his presentation. The webinar will be archived and available on the ICLEO website at accc-iclea.org. Now I'll send it over to Dr. Aguello to kick off the webinar. Thank you, Stephanie, and uh, I'd like to add my welcome as also, and I'm happy to speak to you today. Uh, the topic is uh, two aspects of melanoma, adjuvant therapy and also management of uh, immunotherapy uh, treatment in general it applies to melanoma, of course, but to anything else you might be using these new and exciting checkpoint inhibitors for. Um, uh, we did a webinar recently on metastatic melanoma, so please reference that if you would like, uh, if you haven't uh, already attended that or seen that. Uh, so today's topics are more in terms of what one would do post-surgery, so in the adjuvant setting, what can we do in a high-risk melanoma patient to try to prevent anyone from becoming stage four, which is, of course would be ideal. And we'll talk about that. And then, as I mentioned, I'll go into some of the practical man management aspects of uh, melanoma patients and other patients with cancer that you might be treating with immunotherapy. So let's start with adjuvant therapy for melanoma. Next slide, please. And uh, when you think about melanoma as a disease, uh, to make the point that, fortunately, uh, advanced unresectable melanoma is uh, the smallest number of patients in this pyramid that you can see here. Uh, many patients are low risk, resectable, melanoma in situ, stage 1, 2A. These are patients that are curable with the surgical treatment, therefore obviously our focus is there would be prevention. And then in the uh, advanced unresectable, uh, the top of this pyramid, those are the patients that you know you're going to be using systemic therapy for. But there's a big group of patients in between and it's even more in number than the advanced unresectable patients that have uh, melanoma that is surgically curable but is at a uh, high risk intermediate or high risk for recurrence. So something that would help those patients would be of great clinical value, obviously, in your practice. Next slide, please. So um, if you think about adjuvant therapy as a topic, I divide it up for understanding purposes into the old, the new, and the future. So we'll talk about each of, each of these aspects. Let's start with the old, which is interferon. Next slide. And uh, interferon, as you know, has been around for a long time. It's an FDA-approved therapy in the high-dose regimen and pegylated interferon in the United States. Uh, it's an immunotherapy agent, but a different kind of immunotherapy. It's a cytokine. It's not a checkpoint inhibitor. When you look at the adjuvant therapy regimens, it gets very confusing. There's 
many different doses, many different schedules, and what I've done in this slide is divide them up for practical purposes into um, five different categories, low dose, intermediate dose, high dose, then a short course, and intermittent treatments. And you can see the details here, but the idea is that you can either have low dose regimens that go for a long time, up to 24 months, uh, intermediate dose regimens that also go for various treatment durations, the high dose regimen, which is FDA approved and has the induction and maintenance, and then induction, which is 20 million per meter square, five days a week for four weeks, uh, has been a very unique aspect of that regimen, and that was further studied in short course treatments such as induction times one only, and there's an ECOG trial I showed you regarding that, and then people have tried doing the induction multiple times. So lots of possible ways to give interferon, and let's take a look and see what works. Next slide. So when you look at the interferon trials that have led to regulatory approval, they are mostly ECOG studies, the three uh, on the top three lines of this table, and then the EORTC trial at the bottom. And the ECOG trials all use the high-dose regimen, the one I just mentioned, induction for a month, followed by maintenance for 11 months. And the doses were high. Induction was 20 million per meter square daily, that's a lot, and uh, that's given intravenously, and then the maintenance was half that dose, 10 million units per meter square, given three times a week. And essentially, the long and short of it is that these three regimens established interferon high dose induction plus maintenance in this way, in this schedule, as a approach, a FDA-approved standard treatment for patients with high-risk melanoma. And of course, this has been adopted by some and not adopted by others based upon the fact that it's a toxic regimen and the benefit is modest. Uh, you know, this uh, overall survival was seen in one of the studies and relapse-free survival without overall survival in the other, so a little controversial perhaps. The EORTC18991 trial was given, uh, was, was a trial that used pegylated interferon, so uh, it's a longer-acting interferon given once a week and uh, it's given subcutaneously throughout, so it's much easier, more practical. And uh, it's an FDA approved regimen for stage three melanoma, less toxicity, a little more tolerable overall, but a longer regimen, up to five years, but the average is 18 months. So these are the different approaches we can use in terms of the approved drugs, or approved regimens for interferon in melanoma high risk. Next slide. So um, this is the data with ECOG 1684, the first ever trial. Next slide, please. And you can see from this build that, uh, next slide as well, that if you look at the comparison, you can see, sorry, go back, Stephanie, to the previous slide. Yeah, there we go. So you can see here that you have a sustained durability of relapse-free survival now follow up 15 years. Those curves are completely flat, which is great. Overall survival comes together, obviously, uh, because people die of other causes for other reasons. So it's very reassuring that this regimen does have a sustained durable benefit, but it's modest, and um, it is the FDA-approved regimen based upon this trial. Next slide. So what can we do to make interferon maybe better or more tolerable? So there have been various approaches that have been tried. You could lower the dose. You could shorten the duration of the treatment of the high-dose interferon by just giving the high-dose IV only one month, much easier, or perhaps use pegylated, given once a week, as I mentioned earlier, and give it treated to tolerance, so essentially maintaining the patient's quality of life. Next slide. So when you look at the first approach of these, basically giving um, interferon induction only, and this is the trial I want to go over with you because we just recently published it in the JCO January of this year, uh, a randomized ECOG trial involving more than 1,000 patients interferon given for one month IV induction only compared to observation patients with intermediate and high-risk melanoma. Mostly intermediate, some high-risk. Next slide, please. And as you can see from this data that in terms of the primary endpoint of the trial, relapse-free survival, there was absolutely no benefit. The hazard ratio was, in fact, about one. And uh, this really showed that the induction alone did not improve the chances of these patients to avoid or delay a relapse. Next slide, please. So, Interferon, right now, based upon what we know, we need more than the one month. If you're going to give interferon, you're going to give the one month followed by maintenance, or you're going to give the pegylated. Both are approved regimens. Both improve relapse-free survival, but we need to do better if we can. So let's look at what we have newly approved available, and that's ipilimumab, which, as you might know, is used extensively in metastatic melanoma. Next slide, please. So this is the trial that established the use of ipilimumab 
in the adjuvant setting. It's a European trial with some U.S. participation. And I want to simplify it. Think about, think about this as an adjuvant trial for high-risk melanoma stage 3 patients, randomized to ipilimumab given four doses, the standard induction, followed by maintenance up to three years. So it was sort of a standard metastatic melanoma type protocol. But the dose was 10 milligram per kilogram. That's very important because in metastatic melanoma, as you know, the approved dose is 3 milligram per kilogram. So a little confusing here, but it was done because at the time the trial was designed, it was thought 10 might be better. So this was the design of this compared to a placebo. So a clean study, uh, and uh, the idea was to see if this would produce a benefit in relapse-free survival and overall survival. Next slide, please. And indeed, in terms of the uh, results from this trial, this was reported uh, a while ago in 2015. As you can see, the primary endpoint recurrence-free survival was positive for the treatment versus placebo. You can see the log rank uh, p-value and the hazard ratio, et cetera. Next slide, please. We were all waiting anxiously for overall survival from this trial, and this just came out uh, recently in the fall of last year, and this is the overall survival, and indeed the overall survival also was better, 65% versus 54% for placebo. Next slide. So it looks like a, a nice positive trial, but there is some concern in terms of the toxicity. You're looking at grade 3 and 4 toxicity as expected, you know, this is ipilimumab, 10 mix per keg, it's a high dose. You're talking about more than half the patients having a grade 3 and grade 4 toxicity, and there were also five treatment-related deaths. So it is a regimen that does have efficacy, but it needs to be used cautiously, and there needs to be experience, and certainly should not be given to everyone. And given the fact that we have beaten ipilimumab in the metastatic melanoma arena, I think we need to perhaps look to the future, so the next slide, please, in terms of what can we do to uh, even understand ipilimumab better and potentially look at even PD-1 inhibitors like pembrolizumab and nivolumab. So here is an effort, uh, an important study, ECOG-1609, that many of you may have participated in. This is a randomized trial with a control arm of high-dose interferon. So the, e the EURTC trial I showed you had an inactive placebo control. This has an active interferon control. So a good trial, 10 mix per kg of an IPI or 3 mix per kg of IPI randomization versus high dose interferon. So let's see what this trial shows. We don't have results yet, but the trial has fully accrued. Next slide. And then looking to the future, next slide please, you're talking about the PD-1 inhibitors here, and there are multiple PD-1 inhibitor trials that are either completed or ongoing. And um, I've shown you on this table here, if you've got nivolumab versus ipilimumab, you've got pembrolizumab versus placebo, and then perhaps uh, the most, uh, I think, uh, most important one of all of these, which is the SWOG intergroup ECOG trial, which is looking at pembrolizumab versus high-dose interferon. And you can also choose high-dose epilumab if you randomize the patient to the standard treatment. So it's basically a two-arm study, pembrolizumab, the experimental arm, and the patient who gets randomized to the standard arm, if you will, can pick high-dose interferon or high-dose epilumab. So it's a straightforward trial based upon what is currently FDA approved, because high-dose epilumab is FDA approved, available to us for use in the United States in the adjuvant setting. Next slide, please. So um, another important trial, which I believe also is accruing very well and may have finished accrual very recently, in fact, is this EORTC trial. It's a placebo control with crossover. And what this is is high-risk melanoma, surgically cured, receiving either pembrolizumab or placebo, and if they recur, they are unblinded, and if they receive placebo, they can cross over to pembrolizumab. So some of us like to call this a trial of pembrolizumab now versus later, and it's a nice design. Wait and see what this uh, result uh, eventually shows us, and uh, lots of data to come, as you can tell in the adjuvant setting. Next slide, please. So we should not forget about the BRAF mutated patient. The BRAF mutated patient, of course, can receive immunotherapy, can go on these adjuvant trials, no problem, but what about potentially using BRAF-based MAP kinase inhibitor type therapy in the adjuvant setting. So there's a couple of trials that are um, in progress here. This is a combination of uh, dibrafenib trametinib versus placebo, and there was a trial of emirafenib versus placebo. Uh, we wait and see what these results show, a different approach, not an immunotherapy approach, but drugs that have been highly successful in the metastatic setting for BRAF-positive patients. Could they be also applied in the adjuvant setting? And that remains an open question at this point in time. Next slide, please. So in summary for adjuvant therapy, we still would consider interferon to be a standard option for many patients, but not all. 
ipilimumab high dose is also an option, but we still, not, still don't have data with ipilimumab compared to an active control. It certainly beats placebo. And it has high toxicity, so it does beg the question, is it justifiable in the adjuvant setting? Or should you wait until patients are metastatic and then treat them with immunotherapy with ipilimumab and uh, pembrolizumab or nivolumab in that setting? Uh, certainly we don't know that yet, but it is an option and it should be considered for patients and randomized trials are ongoing to address this further. So uh, should we wait for adjuvant anti-PD-1? Of course, that remains an open question. That's going to be, I think, much easier for patients because we know in the metastatic setting it's much less toxic and even more effective, so that makes it a good drug. Uh, compared to ipilimumab, and then the BRAF targeted therapy in the adjuvant setting remains an open question, as I mentioned. Next slide. So now let's move on to some practical considerations for immunotherapy. Next slide, please. And when you think about the two areas in the clinic that are practically important for patients receiving immunotherapy, by that I mean the checkpoint inhibitors specifically, um, there's two areas that one must look at. One is response assessment because it is important to understand that there are some unique response patterns that are seen for patients, as you must know, who are treated with checkpoint inhibitors where it's not a standard resist type response always. And that also brings up the issue of how often to scan and when to scan, so timing of imaging, and then I'll talk about toxicity recognition and management. Next slide. So when you think about um, patients who receive immunotherapy, and this is an example, an extreme example, but a very illustrative example of a patient from New York that um, was treated with ipilimumab, actually, anti-CTLA-4. And you can see the pretreatment scan with disease, and then week 12, you can see massive progression. And this patient, anyone would think, would be someone who uh, is, this drug is not effective. Next slide. Um, to the surprise of the treating physicians, at week 20 without treatment, without further treatment, the patient is now showing some regression, uh, which is surprising, but great. Next slide. And then this is an ongoing uh, response to even now. This patient is doing very well. Next slide, please. And this brings up the issue of what we have termed pseudoprogression, tumor flare, whatever we want to call it, the idea of a patient having a progression before a response with immunotherapy and this, in this case, a melanoma patient being treated with a CTLA-4 inhibitor. Now, this doesn't happen all the time. It happens about maybe 10, 15, maximum 20% of the time, but it is something to keep in mind. It's important. Next slide. And therefore, when you are looking at potential response patterns um, with a drug like epilumab, and this applies to uh, other checkpoint inhibitors as well, you can have a very standard response, which is straightforward. You can also have an increase in tumor volume and then a response later, or you can have someone who's sort of progressive disease or stable disease and then slow decline or a new lesion develops even, which by resist would be disease progression, but then they end up with a response afterwards. So you've got to keep this in mind. Next slide. And therefore, when you're thinking about, you know, assessing these patients, you still use um, Resist criteria. Next slide, please. So the resist criteria you can see are straightforward. It's you know we all use these. Uh, they're very strict. And the most important thing about resist criteria is that um, you uh, have a new lesion in that patient, and immediately that patient is resist progression. Also, there is no requirement for confirmation, and that's important. So there's been a proposal to use um, maybe the uh, immune-related response criteria. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, can you not hear me anymore? Yes, we can still hear you. Oh, good. OK. So next slide, please, uh, Stephanie. Is it this current one or the next one, uh, Dr. Aguala? Just next slide, so the next, uh, the, the build on this slide. If you go to the next slide, it should come up. It says the connection has been lost. Uh, we can still hear you. But I guess uh, the slides are not advancing on my computer. Oh, OK. Give me one second. I do apologize for the inconvenience. Thanks. Uh, so, Dr. Agawala, we're right now, we're on um, slide of the overall survival with tumor responses, if you want to start there. Um, so, shall I just pull up my the presentation? 
because I, uh, I guess yeah. the screen isn't working. Okay, hold on yeah. one second. I'm going to pull up the slide presentation. Okay, give me a minute. Sorry for this. I don't know what happened here. It's okay. Should have had this open. Let's see. All right, so I'm pulling it up as we speak. And which slide did you say we were on, Stephanie? We are on the association of overall survival with tumor responses. Okay, so if you could actually go to um, what on my thing is the slide 26, and mm -hmm. it is the response assessment resist versus immune related. And uh, the slide that is the second one in that set, or showing the box around immune-related uh, yes, criteria. Sir. We're, we're on that Thank one you. right now. Perfect. So sorry about that, but when you look at the immune-related criteria, it's a little bit different than resist because all it does is it takes away the uh, fact that if you have a new lesion, you're immediately a progressor. You can actually have a new lesion and then respond later. And also confirmation is required. So as you might know, in most of our, or almost all our melanoma trials at least, we require, unless the patient is clinically going downhill very quickly, we require a confirmation scan to prove that indeed resist, uh, to prove indeed that there has been progression in, in uh, two se sequential scans to make sure the patient is really, really progressing and not having a late response. So next slide, please, is the Association of Overall Survival Tumor Response. So here you can see uh, a graph of survival of patients in three groups. And I'm going to walk through this with you real quick. The green line at the top is patients who do not progress by both criteria, resist and immune related. Obviously, they do very well. The blue at the bottom is those who progress by both criteria. And they, of course, don't do very well. But there is this important group in between that progresses by resist but does not progress by immune related. And they have a better survival. So this data indicates that, that looking at immune-related criteria is actually important and may predict for clinical outcome, which is, I think, a very, very important point to make. Next slide, please. So the key points about evaluating activity are that you should be aware that some patients may have a delayed good outcome, which could be stable disease or response later on, even if you have new lesions. Of course, it doesn't happen in everybody, and if you've got to use clinical judgment, if they're going downhill quickly, clinically then, of course, that's probably not going to happen. And therefore, we don't do imaging um, for our patients too early. We wait 12 weeks and then repeat the imaging every 12 weeks to get a better handle on what's going on. Um, confirmation of progressive disease should be done unless it's clinically not appropriate. But you want to confirm that that disease progression that you think you're seeing, which could be 22% by resist, is it real or not? And small lesions may be uh, clinically insignificant, and remember, stable disease may be a good outcome as well. In fact, most of our long-term benefit with these checkpoint inhibitors are not complete responders. These are patients who actually have either a partial response, a minor response, or often just stable disease for many years, even up to now 10 years in some of the original apolumumab trials. Next slide, please. So let's move on now to toxicity recognition and management. Next slide. And you can see here a schematic of a person and various body parts and various areas that you can have immune-related adverse reactions. And uh, the way I like to describe it is any itis. So you can have inflammation, itis of any organ. The lungs with pneumonitis, the GI tract will be colitis, skin, dermatitis, and so on. And these are important because they are different. You know, we're all very well trained in our fellowship and nursing programs, et cetera, about managing side effects of chemotherapy. Not so much in immunotherapy, at least not until recently. And uh, this is all about, uh, all about learning internal medicine all over again, literally. In fact, some of the endocrine side effects, which are very common, actually, uh, we do involve an endocrinologist as part of our team now because it's very hard for us who are oncologists to manage, at least, at least for me and for many of us, hard to manage some of these endocrine side effects on our own without help because it's, it's hard to understand what's real, what's not real, and how to treat these patients. So next slide shows you 
some of the timing of these immune-related adverse events. And you know, I will tell you that they're often unpredictable, and they don't happen right away. Uh, in fact, if you give a patient a treatment today and they have a side effect tomorrow, it's not a side effect probably, it's something else. But as you can see from this uh, graphic representation, this is data with ipilimumab, and you can see that if you look at some of the side effects, there is a, a, a some uh, appearance of timing here. So rash is often the first thing to develop, but you can see it develops in about, uh, you know, three or four weeks. So you're talking about the second dose, after the second dose, not right away. And then diarrhea comes a little later. The endocrine hepatitis is even later, but even can be prolonged for a long time. And the liver is even later than that. So there is some timing that can help you, but not clear cut. And next slide shows you that with PD-1 blockade, nivolumab in this situation, it actually is also skin is much more common. The others are much less common, but the timing is is, you know, unpredictable, but the skin is often first, and the endocrine is often the last. And I think that's the way I look at it. Endocrine side effects are often late and can be prolonged. Skin comes on pretty quickly and generally resolves fairly quickly as well. So next slide gives you the overview, and this is just basically principles that I'm sure you apply in your clinics already. It's common sense. Responsibility of everyone. And, you know, this is the team approach. The physician can't handle this on his own or her own and the nurses are very much involved in my clinic, as are our, our PAs and NPs, and it's all about keeping that communication going. We actually have a separate visit in our clinic with our nurse expert who goes over with the patient and family uh, on a day separate from the clinical visit. Sometimes uh, when they're relaxed and able to understand and listen to all the potential side effects and the instructions that they must follow. because. The good news is these, these drugs are not very toxic. In fact, the PD-1 inhibitors have a less than 10% grade 3 and grade 4 toxicity. So most people don't get toxicity, so they forget what you teach them in their first visit. And you've got to keep reminding them that, hey, listen, if you get diarrhea, just don't ignore it. Call us. Because if the side effects happen, they happen at home, not in the clinic. So they need to call you. So involvement of the patient is critical. They have got to report it to us, continuous education before each dose of therapy we will assess the patient clinically. We don't see them in between treatment cycles, but the day off, for sure. Get some labs, make sure they're okay, and uh, you know manage things appropriately. Don't forget about things like diabetes and hyperglycemia, which can develop from these side of, from these treatments as a side effect on the pancreas and other things as well. So next slide. Now I'm going to walk you through a little bit uh, specifically what side effects we look for. Here's dermatitis. You can see what it looks like. And then if you biopsy it, you see a lot of lymphocytic infiltration, which is typical. This is an immune-related event. Next slide, please. Colonoscopy, if in a patient with colitis, will show this picture. It looks like ulcerative colitis, you know, it's, uh, inflammation of the GI tract. Uh, if you do a biopsy, you'll see chronic inflammation, et cetera, eosinophilia. So this is colitis that can occur. Next slide, please. So we look at the next slide, and I'm going to let Stephanie build it as I talk. But essentially, there's four grades, and if you look at grade one, you know, it's graded by the number of stools and the overall clinical picture. You try to make it as objective as you can, but the idea is mild to moderate to severe. So if it's mild, less than four stools per day, you can just give oral fluids, anti-motility agent like loperamide. If it's grade two, you want, of course, hold immunotherapy, but you might use steroids, and the steroids will be low-dose steroids, 0 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram per day of prednisone. That's considered low-dose, and if it works, you can taper them off pretty quickly. For grade three, you may want to admit them sometimes. You don't always have to do that, but you want to use high-dose steroids, which is 1 to 2 milligram per kilogram of prednisone or equivalent per day. And if you ever get to that point of high-dose steroid, the important take-home message here is if you taper it, you must, when, or should I say when you taper it, it should be tapered very slowly over a minimum of four weeks. The biggest mistake that we used to make was tapering it too quickly because it, the patients respond very well. And it's very tempting to take them off the steroids quickly, and you should not. And of course, if it's grade four, which you hope to never get to, you know, you admit them in the hospital and you might even need to you give uh, infliximab as a backup plan. So moving on to the next, which is pulmonary toxicities. Uh, that's an important one. Uh, you know, it's less common than we thought it might be, but it does occur, pneumonitis. And, you know, it's less common in melanoma than in non-small cell lung cancer. That's important because it's also more confusing in non-small cell lung cancer. You have uh, patients who have lung disease anyway, baseline lung tumors, and how do you figure out what's pneumonitis, what's not? But you've got to have a high index of suspicion. You may just have symptoms and no signs, and I always consider steroids in this situation just to give a test dose to see if they respond. The next slide shows you the management. So if it's grade one, you, you hold immunotherapy, give steroids, 
Um, and if it's symptomatic, which means that they're actually having uh, limitations of their ADLs, uh, activity daily living, you should be very careful and give them a higher dose steroids and watch them very, very closely. You must respect pneumonitis. This is a not doesn't happen very often, but often missed. And if you don't intervene quickly, this can be dangerous for the patient and require steroids. And I will tell you, if I get somebody with with symptomatic pneumonitis that's severe, I consider that to be a reason not to go back to uh, immunotherapy for that patient. So the next slide shows you grade three symptomatic. What you do, it's a permanent discontinuation of immunotherapy. You might hospitalize them, high dose steroids, and you may want to bronchoscope them, but not always and life-threatening, you never want to get there, which means you might be in the ICU and intubated. Very, very rare, of course, thank goodness. And then moving on to the next slide of hepatotoxicity, it's usually an asymptomatic rise in ASD or ALT, and some of these numbers can be quite impressive, so you've got to watch for it. You can also get asymptomatic rises of amylase and lipase, and you think there might be pancreatitis going on, but the patient's asymptomatic, no symptoms, so you've got to be kind of putting the clinical picture along with the number. And obviously, if you have liver metastases in the patient, you want to think about could there either be new liver mets or the mets have gotten worse, which is accounting for this, or is it the drug? And my, uh, my philosophy is always blame the drug until proven otherwise. Certainly review their medications, make sure they're not consuming alcohol. And management of hepatotoxicity, the next slide again, a build slide here. So it goes from grade one to four based upon these numbers. You can see there we try to make given some, give some numbers, upper limit or normal, based upon your lab. So if it's, you know, mild, you can just basically watch the patient carefully, you can continue on, but if it's grade two, you hold, you give steroids, check LFTs more frequently and taper the steroids over four weeks, like I said earlier. If it's grade three, then you know, you consider not going back to immunotherapy ever. Make sure you give them the steroids anyway. And uh, if it's grade four, then you never go back to immunotherapy in that patient, obviously, and you may want to give mycophenolate, which is your backup drug for hepatitis. So, um, in fixumab with GI, and mycophenolate with hepatotoxicity are the backup drugs after steroids. And then moving on to the next uh, endocrine disorders, this is something that is, is very important because it's the most common side effect actually with PD-1 inhibitors is something affecting thyroid function. We've learned more and more about this, and you can see patients that are walking into your clinic feeling and looking great, and their TSH is 40. And you're like, how come this patient is in comatose? And uh, that's a problem. Some of it is biochemical, it's, uh, you know, something that may not be clinically relevant, and that's exactly why I'm consulting endocrinology quite often. They help me manage these patients, and um, uh, it's like um, some, I, I, if I see these numbers, I, of course, if it's mild to moderate thyroid problems, I can fix it myself, but if it's something I'm not quite getting or understanding or if it's involving you know, other thyroid hormones like ACTH, because this could be pituitary-based. Pituitary and the pituitary is a big, you know, the big granddaddy of all these endocrine organs, and it's tough to understand the pituitary well and manage it. So I would strongly recommend that you cultivate a good endocrinologist as part of your team. The next slide shows you hypophysitis, and uh, I will tell you a pearl in terms of what I learned a long time ago, is if a patient is having a new headache on immunotherapy, checkpoint inhibitor, especially if they're tired, send that patient to the MRI scanner right away. And in fact, you may want to also put them on steroids right away while you wait for that scan. Because headache could be brain mets, but it could be pituitary. And if it's with fatigue, it's almost always pituitary. And it's very classic. I saw a patient recently just like this. And uh, it's a reason to discontinue immunotherapy and not go back at all, because this can be long term. And the patient needs steroids with a very slow taper. And sometimes, unfortunately, they require steroids lifelong at physiologic doses. But you know that's OK if the, if the disease is responding to treatment, which is often the case. So management for hypophysitis, next slide is hold immunotherapy, get endocrine involved, make sure you call your radiologist if you're getting an MRI, tell them to look at the pituitary because sometimes they don't and they might miss it. Um, used to happen here when there was new, now my radiologist is very attuned to it, so they look for it, hormone replacement is needed, and um, you may go back but think hard about it. Uh, some of them require maintenance steroids like I said. And the next slide shows you some other less common toxicities. Is, you know, you don't forget about the ocular toxicity, uveitis, some of blurred vision on immunotherapy. Think uveitis. Try to get an ophthalmology person to see that person quickly. It's not easy to get them into the ophthalmology clinic. So once again, make friends with an ophthalmologist. That's what I did. Neurological syndromes are rare, but you know, you certainly want neurology, in, neurology info that happens. And then we're seeing more and more reports of cardiac stuff, heart failure, myocarditis. So be careful about that too. 
So overall, next slide, management of these immune-related adverse events, you know, you got to communicate with the patient. It's all about recognizing it early, intervening early, explaining to the patient that if you don't tell me about it, I can't fix it. And if I don't fix it, I'm going to end up with a much bigger problem. And, uh, you know, patients are often worried that, oh, the drug's working. I don't want to stop it, and therefore I'm not going to tell you about my side effects. And I tell them that don't do that because more is not better with immunotherapy always. And unfortunately, if you don't tell me early and I don't jump in soon, and I, you have side effects that go from grade one to grade three, the delay in your treatment resumption is going to be even longer, and I may never get to you. So it's important to explain this to them. Um, also remember there are other patients, are there doctors involved in the care of your patient? Not, not everyone who's an immunotherapy specialist. So a busy ER on a weekend, a patient ends up there with diarrhea, and the ER doctor sends the patient home saying, uh, you know, it's just diarrhea, take some uh, lopramide and, you know, call your doctor on Monday. We actually give these patients a card to give to the ER doc and say, listen, my doctor told me to tell you that I'm on this immunotherapy agent, this diarrhea may not be just a simple diarrhea and might need me to be admitted and given steroids. So those kind of things that help. It's all about education, really, and it's very important. Next slide kind of summarizes that, whom to call, why to call, when to call, where to call. You know, it's all about being available all the time. Of course, not all of us can be available all the time, obviously. So it's about expanding your healthcare team. And you know, most of the good news is that now PD-1 inhibitors are being used in so many cancers that almost every oncologist is getting quite used to this. Uh, there was a time when it was just us melanoma guys, and it was hard because not everyone knew this, but it's getting much better. So uh, the next slide shows you the immuno-oncology framework. Uh, the point is that this is a very multidisciplinary approach, and you know, you have to look at response assessment, toxicity management as a continuum, and uh, you're going to have a lot of people on your healthcare team that you didn't think you would have, like endocrinology, ophthalmology, dermatology sometimes, that will help your patients. So summarizing the next slide, immunotherapy requires a team approach. I think I've said that multiple times. And the team includes the patient, and that's very key. Uh, unique response patterns may occur, so do allow the time for treatment to work within reason. You may have some pseudoprogression, but don't overestimate sort of progression either. Every progression is a progression until proven otherwise, and that's important to keep in mind. And toxicity recognition management is unique. It's about education. Don't be afraid to use steroids as needed. The good news is, and I tell this to my patients as well, if you use steroids to stop the immune system or to slow it down after it has started, it is okay. It's not going to take away the clinical benefit. You do not want to use steroids prophylactically because that immune system, if you uh, the car analogy we use all the time, that car may never start. But if the car is moving and it's moving too fast, you can put the brakes on, slow it down with steroids, and that's okay. You still have the car moving to the right speed that you want it to, and do follow the guidelines. And I think that's all I have. I apologize for that break in the middle, uh, technical issues, but I'm happy to take any questions now. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Agawala, for the engaging presentation. And I do have a couple of questions. Um, Treatment-related adverse events using a mobile app seems high at 48% disconnecting treatment as a result of treatment-related AE. Are you able to resolve these adverse events through supportive care agents? And if so, do some of or most of the patients go back on treatment? If not, what are their options for adjuvant therapy? Do they have interference? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, you know, that's exactly why when I was talking about adjuvant therapy, I wanted to emphasize the concern of the toxicity uh, in the adjuvant setting. So, you know, just philosophically speaking, I'm much more willing to accept toxicity in the metastatic disease setting where I know the patient, if they don't get treated, uh, you know, will probably not make it. Whereas the adjuvant setting, they could be cured without my help. And so I should do no harm, you know. So, unfortunately, you know, uh, some of these side effects can be long-term, troublesome, and sometimes permanent. So it's, it's really a judgment call, which is why I am really anxiously waiting for some of the PD-1 data to come out. I will tell you, on a you know, personal level, I've always been a big believer in adjuvant therapy my whole life. In fact, I've given hundreds of patients interferon, high dose, which is, you know, a fairly toxic regimen because I knew that whatever I could do to prevent them from becoming stage four would be potentially worthwhile. Now I've kind of changed my philosophy a little bit personally. I feel that, you know, we have good results in the stage four area. So maybe I don't want to push that envelope that far, that much, and I don't want to do any harm. You know, maybe I'll just see how it goes. So I'm, I'm waiting for the results of the randomized trials. I, I'm not a, I don't use that much epi in the adjuvant setting. i got to say I use pegylated interferon more and more. 
But really, the right answer is I'm, I'm randomizing almost everyone I can convince to go on a study on an ongoing trial, which is what we're doing right now. And so, you know, as far as going back on treatment, yeah, you know, we are pretty good at resolving most of the side effects, but not all. And uh, I've got several patients on adjuvant therapy trials that have, you know, been on steroids for six months or longer and had a big problem to get them off. It's not easy. So it does affect quality of life, and you want to balance it out. Now, if it, if I think if the randomized trial of IPI versus interferon is positive, that makes IPI's case a lot more stronger. But I still would like to wait for the PD-1 data. And then my second question is, have there been any studies for um, pseudoprogression for anti-PD-1 inhibitors? Yes, I um, actually the um, the graph I showed you of the three uh, curves in three different colors, you know, with the progression by both immune-related and uh, resist and so on, that actually I should have mentioned it, and I'm glad, I'm glad you asked. Uh, it was a PD-1 inhibitor trial. In fact, it was pembrolizumab for melanoma patients. So we see very similar things with with the CTLA-4 and PD-1. It's perhaps a little less common with the PD-1, simply because I think they're more effective. And I also know that from you know my own experience and talking to colleagues that this seems to be a little more prevalent in melanoma than in other cancers. So it's not as common in lung cancer. So and I, might, I guess my advice would be if you have progression, it is progression, but if you can wait a little longer, especially if it's a melanoma patient and you're not losing ground, it's worth staying, keeping them on treatment, and then redo, redoing that scan to confirm progression later on. So you see with both PD-1 and CTLA-4, yes. Well, thank you, Dr. Agawala, for the engaging presentation, and thank you to our audience for participating. The webinar and slides will be available on our website at ACCC-ICLEA.org shortly, and all the registrants will re receive an email with the link. Please also register for our next two webinar installments on March 15th, where Marianne Davis will present management of immune-related adverse events in patients with non-small cell lung cancer. And on April 20th, Dr. Jared West will present on the emerging role of immunotherapy in head and neck cancer. Also, please visit our website at ACCC.clio.org to download our, and read our latest uh, 2016 white paper. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you, Stephanie.